The Dukes of Dice are brought to you by Arcane Wonders, Game Toppers, Two Coffee and No Food Alex, and listeners like you. Welcome to the Duchy. It's time for another episode of the Dukes of Dice podcast, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Coming to you from the Duchy in the Duke City, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the Gateway City, St. Louis, Missouri, it's the Dukes of Dice, a podcast about board, card, and occasionally role-playing games. Today, the Dukes recap Alex and Abby's wedding festivities out at the Gamer's Ranch. Then Sean jumps in with Rory to review Imperial Struggle. And finally, the Dukes will take a look back at their review of Watergate from Capstone Games in their Dukes Double Take. And now, the Dukes of Dice. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Sean. And Alex. Wow, that was a a very powerful and, Alex. This is episode 233, Best at Two. Best at Two, that name or that title suggestion from listener D. Shannon over on our Board Game Geek Guild. We're talking about games that are really good at two. Really, they can only be played at two. Imperial Struggle and Watergate, but uh, there's a little little marriage stuff going on, which uh, in most society is only two people. So that yeah, works. I guess. That, that name works. Jesus, I was at, that went down a weird road right away. Well, 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 hey, why is it weird? Why do you got to make it weird? It doesn't have to be weird. That's, that's on you, man. That's on you, man. No, you made it weird. You made it weird. Anyway, thanks, D. Shannon, for that name suggestion. We, I keep saying name. It's the title, title, title. We get help naming all of our titles uh, for our episodes over on our board game geek guild. We're guild number 2008 and you should go check it out over there because there's lots of cool discussion before every episode where we talk about games that we're discussing in the next episode and our wonderful guild members help name our episode because we're so bad at it. And we'll give you the rest of the runners up for naming or titling naming. We Is naming fine. Naming is fine. We use that term all the time. I don't know <sighs> why you're so hung up on this right now. Okay. Well, so Alex, I'm not going to ask how you're doing because we're going to jump into how you're doing. Ooh, it's going to be it's going to be uh, a good chunk of of uh, the the top half of the podcast. Now wait, wait. Can I get into the very specific part of this moment? This moment of the recording. Sure. This moment, you doing. got it. You do it. So I have been so tired following the wedding stuff, which we'll get into. Uh, I I was asked before I took time off, like, hey, you're not taking any time off in the back end. You sure about that? I was like, yeah, totally fine. No worries. It's going to be great. And now I know why people were asking and saying, hey, you should take some time because I've been napping all week. I've been sleepy. I've been so tired that I was like, I hope I'm not dying because it would be really sad if I died right now. Wow. It would not be a good thing. That's taking it down a weird path. You're a- Yeah, it sure Jeez. is. That's how my mind was working this morning. So I don't normally drink coffee, Sean, but today... Amidst a busy work day, I drank not one, but two cups of very strong coffee, and I am buzzing. I didn't have any lunch, didn't have any snacks, just sat and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked, and now I'm here, and I'm ready to party. Mm. Two cups of coffee, Alex, with, I have had dinner, so I've had food since, but the caffeine buzz remains. You're just a lightweight in every respect, just in every respect. I am 190 pounds, sir. That is not particularly light. Well, no, what? No, in terms of your ability to tolerate. But you said every coffee. respect. You okay. said every respect. Anyway, I'm holding you to that terminology. Great. Perfect. Um, actually, in contrast, I am on like a coffee low. My the Starbucks that I go to every morning, their cold brew machine has been down for the last two days. Oh, no. And, I mean, it's a it's a terrible, terrible first world problem to have regular cold brew with ice. Ugh. That's okay. Didn't it snow up there not too long ago? Or at least in parts of New uh, Mexico? In, in, yeah, in parts of New Mexico. No, we just had this cold snap that came through. Uh, our lows a couple days ago were like, I think, I don't know, like high 60s or something. And then they hit like 40, 40, 45, some, somewhere in there. Uh, All right. we, had, we had to turn off our swamp cooler and uh, turn on the heater for a little bit last night. It was, it was pretty wild. Wow. So, yeah, it's crazy. 2020, man. 2020. It is a time. How are you? What is new in your world? How are you, sir? What's, What's new going with me? on? So real quick, Dukes of Diet update. Things are progressing pretty, pretty nicely. I hit 244.2 uh, 
uh, today. Actually, yesterday, and I was like 240, it was 244.5 this morning. So it was call it 244.5. Um, and that is down, I want to say four or five pounds from the last time I reported. Didn't report last episode, but uh, so about a month ago. So down another five. That brings it to, uh, is that 70.5 pounds? Not bad. In total, since I started a year ago, June. So yeah, that's, that's, going, that's going pretty well. Things have been busy. Very, very busy. What else is new for me, right? But wait, I was going to get another update. Oh, so we've gotten the the weekly, the not the weekly, but the the per episode Dukes of Diet update. Okay. Do we have any uh, Anthony P updates? <laughs> no Anthony P updates. We're still we're we're still corresponding, but I haven't thought to to. I'll, I'll let you know. Have you started your rival podcast with Anthony P yet? Uh, not yet. But did you see the announcement for my new podcast, Alex? I that did not. Was posted in. The chat between you, uh, Steve O'Rourke, and BJ and myself. I was not paying any attention. Apparently, you didn't see. It. Go, go over, go pull up that Facebook chat, and just kind of scroll up, uh-huh. and, and I'll let you do that. And while you're scrolling up, I'll just tell you why I've been so busy and why I've not played that many games recently because we're not going to do recent plays. It's because this last Labor Day weekend, three day weekend, I spent like 24 hours over the course of the entire weekend transferring all of the data from one billing system to a new billing system at the law firm. It's, and I'm only like a, a third of the way done, maybe close to half. It's brutal. It's just brutal. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my updates. Alex, did you, did you find it? Did you nope, find the it's picture? It's still loading. It's still oh, it's loading. loading. Well, remember, remember I joked about doing a Rizzoli and Isles and Isles podcast. Oh yeah. I remember seeing this now. So I put together a little teaser image, which I'll put up on the guild, I guess. It was creepy. How's it creepy? I remember it being creepy. Am I misremembering? I, I don't know. How would it be creepy? Like, I don't remember. I thought it looked creepy. The image? Let me or, look at it again. I might be thinking of something else. I don't know what you're thinking of. Like, this makes zero sense. This is probably a little bit too much like pre-show banter. It's not even pre-show, but top of the show banter since there's not going to be a lot of board game discussion early Wait, on. Wait, let's throw another thing in there. Uh, how did we plan this most recent episode of the Dukes of Dice, Sean? That's a good question, Alex. I think... Uh, actually, no, let's talk about it later. Oh, are we talking, I mean, not much later. No, not much later. <laughs> but all things in their, in their proper place, Alex. Yeah. Because okay. we had. Are we moving to that proper place now? Did you find the picture of the Rizzoli and Isles and Isles? It's, oh. look, it's still loading. I'm not going to, uh. I'm not going to look. How am I going to look? I can't look. Our, our listeners can't look. Anyway, if you want to hear about the announcement for my brand new Rizzoli and Isles and Isles podcast where I am discovering Rizzoli and Isles, the, is it a TNT show, TBS? TBS. TNT's been gone for a while, hasn't it? The TBS uh, cop procedural documity, documity, comma drama. What's it called? What are those called? I'm going to discover it for the first time, and then I'm also going to have topical segments about aisles, things that are lined by chairs. Oh, or- sure, sure. B- by the way, this is a spoiler for later in this discussion, but there was in fact an aisle at my wedding. Perfect. Defined by two sides of, of chairs on either side, right? Yes. And okay. also a very clearly defined aisle runner. Oh, an aisle runner. Ooh, that's a- which had to be which had to be taped down because it was very windy. Okay, I saw this image from a distance. Result I found the image. I found the image. I thought for a second from a distance, without looking in closer, uh-huh. that you had edited our respective faces into this. Huh. But no, it's just the normal image. I just am weird. I saw, okay. what, I saw, I saw what I wanted to see. Wow. Uh, it's a good joke. It's a good funny joke. Uh, this was definitely worth me scrolling for like an hour to, to find. So good job. Good job, Sean. All right. Well, let's, let's move this thing along. It's already a train wreck and, um, you know. So, yeah. So, Alex, you just got married. Congratulations, Mary Duke Alex. Thank you. I am uh, still getting used to having this ring on my finger. Yep. It, yep. It's uh I don't know. Keep it on, keep it off. I got some silicone rings for the gym. Uh, I'm getting used to this whole ring life. This whole this whole married man life. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay. So is the idea there with the silicone ring for the gym? That's like, okay, I obviously don't want to risk damaging my ring, losing my ring, whatever. Okay, I get that. But it's like, look, I for that hour, I I, I still can't I still can't be ringless. You don't like, want I, people picking you up. <laughs> I just look so swole, Sean. I look so beefy that uh, that they're just people clamoring over themselves to to get a piece of this man. And I'm married. Look, I can't have people getting okay. the wrong impression. 
Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Who made the decision for the silicone rings? Was that an Abby decision, an Alex decision, or a joint decision? This was an Alex decision with help from Abby. It was an Alex <laughs> decision because I may just in general tend to wear the silicone ring more than the normal ring. Okay. Uh, just because it's, you know, still getting used to it. It's not the most comfortable. I might get used to it later, but at the moment, it's, uh, you know, it's not the greatest. So, uh, so yeah, that's a nice little backup plan. And it's a, a good one for if you're, say, swimming or adventuring or whatever else that you can lose this, you know, two, three dollar ring, silicone ring, rather than lose your hint, not actually that expensive wedding ring. Okay. It's a tungsten ring. It's actually okay. super cool, but it was not that expensive. Well, Alex, so we'll talk about the ceremony and the weekend surrounding it, the gamers ranch. But before that, a couple days before we had a little, uh, little online get together. Did we not? We did. And, uh, I will say this was a well pulled off surprise courtesy of sort of yourself, but mostly, mostly. BJ yeah. from board game gumbo and the name father, Steve O'Rourke. Uh, this was pitched as, Hey, we're going to have like a, a, you know, calm bachelor party. It was going to be the Friday before, uh, the whole weekend, but hurricane and whatnot made it that not work so well for BJ. So then it turned into a Wednesday night type of event. And the game plan that I knew of was, Hey, we're going to get together and play smartphone Inc from our sponsor, arcane wonders. It's never a blunder. If you play with arcane wonders, uh, but there was a surprise because BJ and Steve and sort of you had been out gathering folks from different groups and, Hold on, hold on, hold on. I was told this was 90% them and 10% you. So that's hold why on. I said sort Let's of say you. that th that the the planning and the organizing was 90% them, but as far as inviting, like I think I made like 80% of the invites. Oh wow. Okay. Well, then I then I retracted. <laughs> Mostly Sean and a little bit BJ and Steve on no, the no, invites. No, no, no. We don't on the invites. We don't need to we don't need to assign value or percentage of of effort and work. I, you seem very concerned about it, so... You're the one that keeps bringing it up. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so what had happened was, uh, or, or what was supposed to happen was, for the first hour, there were supposed to be people dropping in, dropping out, giving a quick little toast, cheers, hey, so good to see you, congrats on getting married, and then by the time 8 o'clock rolled around, this thing started at, what, 7? And then by the time 8 o'clock rolled around, it was supposed to be just... Just the four of us playing a game. Right. Am, am I understanding the, the format of this right? You, you, yeah, you got the format down, Alex. That didn't happen because people just kind of stuck around. And it was actually a ton of fun. A ton, a ton of fun. We had people from all sorts of different corners of uh, my gaming world. Uh, you had Suzanne Sheldon, Duke Suzanne. You had uh, Jamie Stegmeyer from here in St. Louis. And, of course, Stonemeyer Games. You had uh, the now-retired Stephen Bonacore. You had a bunch of people from the gaming group in Albuquerque, whether it be uh, the Wham Boys, uh, except not both of them, just, just one of the mats, uh, and, uh, and several other folks I hadn't seen in a while, whether that be Eugene or Chris Holm. Uh, we had Anthony Harlan, from, uh, who we met at Dice Tower Con, and we told that story not too long ago. Uh, he hung around for, for a good chunk of time. There's uh, Berkey. Berkey was there from uh, from Game Toppers. Uh, good buddy. Mike Fitzgerald, Baseball Highlights 2045, first mention, uh, dropped in and, and hung around. And, uh, oh, Jeremy Howard. I'm trying mm -hmm. to think. Of, I'm probably forgetting someone. Jake and Danielle oh, were there. Jake and Danielle, right from the beginning, of course. Philip, as well Philip as, Millman, your Baseball ooh, Highlights rival. Oh, Philip Millman. Uh, and actually, yeah, the uh, this this bachelor party became one of the ongoing memes as we all looked very annoyed while he showed off his trophy. Uh, and I should mention uh, Aaron and Lindsay from uh, from Boards Alive and Cult Classic Callback also there. So uh, some folks uh, who who kind of regretfully had to decline, and that was fine. It, it all went great. Um, mm. What was cool was as people showed up, we would kind of cheers them when we saw them connecting, and have a little drink then. And then when they were fully in, we'd say. Hey, it's whoever. Cheers. And boy, oh boy, we'd had a, a good amount of alcohol by the time the night was done, huh? Can I just say that you're breaking someone's heart right now? You're just- Who's heart am I breaking? You're breaking someone's heart. Oh, now I have to look at the picture. Probably the most lovable, friendliest person that like just people immediately latch onto and love and adore. And Emerson Matsuchi? <laughs> Ellie. there. Ellie. Oh, oh, Ellie. Forget you, about your... Yeah, okay. You sorry, monster. Ellie. Wow. <laughs> that was meant to be a nice thing for Emerson. 
That's literally yeah, Ellie, Ellie was there and he's awesome. <laughs> that's literally like the first time Ellie's ever been forgotten. Like literally like, wow. Okay. There were a lot of people with this thing. Well, I don't we know named, if that was clear from the list. We named, or you named all of them, but Ellie, but, but that's fine. <laughs> wow. Sorry, Ellie. My B. Uh, no, it was fun. It was a ton of fun. Sort of gaming talk, sort of wedding talk. Uh, people giving kind of heartfelt toasts, especially on the way out. It was, it was lovely. It was a ton of fun. No games were played and it was great. Yeah, no, it was, it was good. It was good to kind of, to kind of catch up with a bunch of people, uh, that I only talk with here and there. Um, but no, it was, it was a ton of fun. Uh, I forgot we did have another guild member on there. Oh yeah. Uh, Mr. Sean. Mr. My the name. Mr. Sean. Now you forgot him. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm sorry. It's just my name. I, I just, I ticked Sean off for me and then sorry the mr sean yeah you should be anyway uh no it was it was a ton of fun and by the way as hinted at earlier in the show this was a point where we were like hey so pendulum which spoilers sean is planning on reviewing next episode uh had not arrived yet and so we're like i don't know what to do what should we do for this episode i'm gonna be too busy alex i'm gonna be too busy sean we need you to review something. And Sean uh, claims he didn't agree to actually do this with someone else, but I think he did. I am merely claiming I don't remember. That's all I'm claiming. Okay. I'm not saying I did or didn't. I just don't remember. Great. Well, well I didn't confirm with you before posting the on deck, so I kind of locked you into uh, to a, a Rory review fate. Well, it was kind of interesting because I know we hadn't discussed it, and then we had played a game of Pendulum Sunday, and... I told Mariah, Mariah's going to wind up uh, reviewing it with me. And I had told her like, okay, so here's the schedule. Like we'll probably wind up recording Friday or Saturday. Here's our schedule. And I was going to reach out to you, uh, some, sometime that night. And I, I forgot. And then I saw it on, on the on deck and on one hand, I was like, oh, well that's kind of good. Cause that was going to be a bit crazy. Um, and then on the other hand, I'm like, all right, now I have to talk about this game some more with Rory. Okay, fine. Um, so <laughs> So yeah, I don't recall. I don't recall planning it. I don't know that I can trust your recollection of how this went down. So if there was anyone on the call that was there for that, that can just corroborate one way or another. I mentioned, because it was interesting when we were talking pre-show, I was like, no, I said like maybe Ellie and I would play it that weekend online. And, and then I was like, oh, or I said, Matt, I thought, you know, our buddy Matt Walker, I thought he would like the game. I remember that. I don't remember anything else. So if you were there and can corroborate, we'd appreciate it. Good on you. Settle this ya. this ducal duel. Of yeah, whatever. Words. Ultimately, I won anyway because you're just doing it, so it's fine. I traded. I traded like one annoyance for another, like the annoyance of having to do like a remote recording with not having to like do a grueling game playing schedule. So just trading off. Straight yeah. off. I look, I, I think it's a perfectly fine resolution to all this. So in any case, big thanks. I felt so I really the one word was loved that came out of this. I felt really loved and, and cared for in the whole thing. Uh, for folks who don't know, and we'll, we'll talk about the wedding in a moment. This this past weekend was actually not when the wedding was supposed to be, but when the bachelor party was supposed to be. And it would have been, as I'll describe the gamers ranch in a bit, absolutely epic, 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 epic. Uh, and it worked beautifully for wedding purposes and was the perfect plan and everything went great as I'll describe, but, um, you know, didn't quite get that experience. I think there's a, there's some discussion already and some thought about possibly doing a, uh, belated bachelor party, possibly a, a, not actually a bachelor anymore party, uh, when things have, uh, calmed down COVID wise, because Sean, you have to get to the gamer's ranch. Oh my goodness. You have to get to the gamer's yeah. ranch. Yeah. So. And, and I, not, not enough good things to say, wait, too many good things to say. There we go. <laughs> too many, good, too many good things to say about the gamers ranch. Uh, but this was a, this was an awesome connective way of, of feeling bonded with the gaming community, uh, right before moving into marriage. So it, it felt like a worthy replacement, a worthy celebration, and it would not have happened without yourself, uh, as well as BJ and the name father. So I felt loved and I can't, Thank all three of you enough. And also everyone who showed up, especially Ellie, who I forgot just a bit ago. Yeah, no, it was, it was definitely a good time. And it was just, there was just so much randomness. Like it felt, it almost felt like being like at a con or at a bar, like when you're just 
like there's no like we're not trying to play a game we're not but we're just like sharing stories reminiscing memories like it was it was cool it was really cool it w- it was really cool it was and it was something where some folks afterwards had said hey i needed that this this was something that was super helpful during this time this time of covid to feel connected much like at a con to other folks in the community so i hope other folks have continued doing uh zoom calls or things like that since or it, it's something people are looking at because it was, although there were a lot of people, it wasn't super chaotic and it was a ton of fun. Really a ton yeah. of fun. So. Yeah. All right. To the wedding, Sean. To the, yeah. to the uh, ducal event of the year. The highlight of everyone's year, let's be honest. Uh, so, so let me talk about the, the setting and circumstances. And some of this has been discussed on prior episodes, but I, I think it's worth getting into full context. Uh, so I proposed to Abby, uh, my fiance, now my wife, uh, in, uh, right before Thanksgiving of last year in, in late November and did it in Tower Grove Park, a place where we walked on our first date and it was lovely. And then we started planning and Abby, uh, although she enjoys being on the podcast is not a huge extrovert. So the thought of having a huge 200, 300 person wedding made absolutely no sense. And we had talked at the time about a few options. Uh, one was a multi-stop wedding tour where we'd have, events in North Carolina and St. Louis and New Mexico and California. Uh, another version of it was Abby's kind of idealized version was get kind of a courthouse wedding and then have dinner with, you know, 30 close friends and family uh, and enjoy times that way. What we had settled on was a wedding of about 80, 90 people at third degree glass factory here in St. Louis. And then COVID happened. And the plans changed and they changed multiple times. It changed from, hey, we're having it at third degree, 80 80 to 100 people to maybe we'll have 20 people and we'll stream the thing on Zoom to Abby's bachelorette party getting canceled at the last second when, you know, uh, one of the people who was supposed to be attending got COVID and we decided, hey, this doesn't make any sense. We need to rethink this completely. And so we rethought it uh, by going over to the Gamers Ranch. So to give some other context, the Gamers Ranch was, again, where my bachelor party was supposed to be. Uh, David uh, Rehagen, who runs the Gamers Ranch, had reached out a long time ago, listened to the Dukes of Dice, knew I had moved to St. Louis, and said, hey, I have this ranch. I know you work at Gray Fox. We'd love to have you out there for a retreat. It's on me. No problem at all. Come out and enjoy yourselves. And so not this past November when I proposed to Abby, but the year before when I was still at Gray Fox, we had a retreat out there. This place is a gamer's dream. The name, though, I would say, is slightly deceptive. Not because there aren't a ton of games. There is a cons library worth of board games at this place, Sean. Racks and racks and racks of games. With new stuff, still in shrink. Completely, I mean, just packed with stuff. Packed. There's also a Crokinole table. There's a uh, MAME arcade emulator, which has a ton of N64 and SNES and NES games. There's a ping pong table. There's a pool table. There's two VR simulators. There's a non-VR setup that has uh, uh, flight controls. There's PS4 Pros in every room. So the gaming part is absolutely well covered out at the ranch. But there's more to it. There's an 11-acre man-made lake out on this property. Uh, there is a waterbound trampoline. There are ATVs. There are running trails. There's a disc golf course. There's a, a ton of outdoor space, 145 acres, a ton of indoor space. Uh, we were able to comfortably fit, I think the ranch can fit 20 to 25 people. We had about half that staying over the course of this weekend. Uh, so that's the venue. I had reached out to David when I, when I knew I was getting married and said, hey, I'd love to have a bachelor party out there. Is Labor Day weekend good? He's like, hey, if it's open, it's all yours. Go for it. Well, then, when we were replanning this maybe a month and a half, two months ago, I reached back out to him and he said, yeah, no, wedding sounds great. Let's try it. Took Abby out there. She was a little skeptical hearing, <laughs> hey, we're going to have a wedding at the Gamers Ranch. And we drove out there, spent about 20 minutes kind of showing her the place, checking out bedrooms, getting a, a lay of the land, and her seeing it in person, she was like, okay, this could work. Now, she wasn't getting her hopes too up because literally two days before was when her bachelorette party got canceled, wiped off the face of the map. So until this was in motion, people were there, people were in St. Louis, this was happening. We weren't sure this was going to be a thing. My parents drove in from New Mexico, about a 14, 15 hour drive. Her parents drove in from North Carolina, about a 14, 15 hour drive. 
Uh, we had a couple of people fly in. My brother from California, uh, our friend Brianna, who married us uh, from from Seattle, and uh, Abby's Abby's sister and their family flew in from the Outer Banks of North Carolina. So we had some folks flying, but for the most part, people were driving, and that was the crew. That was it. That was who was there uh, for most of the weekend. And for folks who've been married, you may have some opinion one way or the other of your in-laws. We were lucky in that our in-laws had met before, once in Florida, and our moms had, uh, had, were together for when Abby picked out her wedding dress, and we had our engagement shoot. So there was some amount of familiarity. This was planned as sort of a weekend, families merging kind of get-together, which, for the wrong families, could have been a disaster, could have been not good. We're lucky that our families were very collaborative, uh, very supportive of this, very together. And so they went to work planning this, uh, helping build arch, think of decorations for the table, uh, help plan out food, help plan out and pick up the cake, help with any sort of logistics that came up. And during the weekend, it was great. Uh, my brother you know, would play VR with, uh, with her sister, Abby's sister. Uh, my, my, our dads played pool together. Our moms chatted the whole weekend away. The families felt, it felt very much like a one big family kind of vacation, not really two families. And that was really cool and a really unique way to do this. It was sort of two families becoming one in, a, in not just a symbolic way, but in a very real way to the point where after this was all done, uh, there was talks of, hey, maybe we'll do some sort of family get together in the future, whether it be in Santa Fe or on some sort of trip together when COVID isn't rearing its ugly head. So it all went great. Uh, in terms of gaming, Sean, I did very little of it. I learned the rules to Mariposas from uh, the new Elizabeth hmm. Hargrave game from AEG. Didn't play it. I did uh, teach my brother Targi. The game was in German. It was a German edition of Targi. And uh, so had to kind of translate cards on the fly. Uh, played a ton of Crokinole. Oh, so much Crokinole, Sean. That game is great. Love Crokinole. And uh, people really got into that. Played a ton of Beat Saber on VR. That game is epic. And if you haven't played Beat Saber on VR, you well should. Um... So not a big gaming weekend, though. A lot of time in the lake, a lot of time, you know, writing vows, uh, <laughs> a lot of time playing Frisbee with my brother. But although it's the gamer's ranch, it, it, really the focus doesn't have to be on games when you're there. I can tell you, Sean, if we're there, oh, we're going to town. There's there's so much to try, so much to play. Um, oh, bit full sets of Hero Skate, mini sets, Gloomhaven, Ooh. you take your pick. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's some stuff there that would definitely get your attention. Uh, so. Anyway, it was a ton of fun. Uh, it's an amazing space. I've talked about this as being one of my top 10 favorite places ever. And this did not change that. And obviously now there's even more significance. Uh, there were two trees that were behind us during the wedding itself. Uh, those trees are going to be planted on property and kind of be a nice little memory that if Abby and I ever come back there, which seems likely, uh, we'll be able to say, oh yeah, hey, that those are the trees that were behind us when we got married. And they'll be kind of a part of the property. So... Yeah, David David was amazing. He helped out with everything. He's an incredible host. He seemed uh, really overjoyed to have folks out there and uh, to see this space transformed into a wedding venue. There was a big fish feeder back behind where we were uh, where we were getting married out on the patio at the Gamers Ranch, uh, and he was had no problem with us moving it. There was a trampoline in the background. We swam that over somewhere else. He was incredibly accommodating. Uh, I, there's absolutely no way I could possibly repay him or thank him enough. Uh, our families were, were blown away with his generosity and his presence. And uh, I will just say, this is a must-visit gaming attraction. Must-visit gaming attraction. If you're out in St. Louis for uh, a geek way or you just want some sort of gaming retreat, you can't, you can't do much better than the Gamers Ranch. It is, it is unreal how cool this place is. And you have to be there to really get it. But when you're there, oh, it's so cool. So I, I talked all this time and I realized I haven't talked at all about the wedding itself. Um, and Sean, as you can attest, not the longest ceremony. It was, uh, it was, uh, 18 minutes start to finish. No, it's cer certainly short, which, which I'm appreciative of. Let me ask you real quick though, Alex, yeah, yeah, can yeah, you yeah. adjust your camera? I've been staring at nothing but your mouth <laughs> and that's, and while it's a lovely view <laughs> and you know, it's just, thank you. I just want to see those eyes, those beautiful oh, eyes. This is, oh, these beautiful sparkling eyes that you could just fall into and swim in forever. I get it. <laughs> But yeah, it was uh, it was a short ceremony, which was uh, which was pretty nice, and uh, and also it was it was live streamed. It was my my buddy Hockey Dave, 
uh, who, who unfortunately has been laid off from the Blues, not because of, you know, job performance, but because they don't have home games. And so they don't have a ton of home revenue. So uh, he's hoping to get back with them when hopefully times are better. But I uh, know he came out there with his girlfriend and uh, filmed the ceremony and uh, did a fantastic job. Uh, the picture looks, it was, this was on, a, by, by the way, Sean, this was on an iPhone 8. Sure. Is uh, what was used to film this. And I think it looked pretty good from what I could see from other people's screens. It was, it was interesting. We had had a first look a couple of hours before. Uh, I was super nervous for that. Abby was super nervous for that. I was crying. She looked so gorgeous in, in her dress. Uh, I was wearing a, a, a nice light blue suit, but I looked pretty good too. Gold tie. Uh, fetching. You were fetching. I was fetching. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we did family pictures after that. And then... I mean, pretty much it was, okay, it's wedding time. Here we go. And we went. There wasn't a lot of buildup or anticipation. It was just a, nope, it's time. Let's do this. So, uh, yeah, it was sort of a, a short thing from Brianna. Uh, it was my vows, which had Abby cry. Abby's vows, which had me cry. Uh, exchanging of rings and bing, bam, boom. You make my dreams come true from Hollow Notes comes on and we are married. So, uh at the reception, uh, so at the reception, we had Pappy's uh, Smokehouse, uh, St. Louis-style barbecue. Very good. Uh, they delivered all the way out there, two hours out to the ranch, which was surprising, but it was very tasty. Uh, we had a cake from La Patisserie Choquette, pumpkin cake with salted cream, uh, salted caramel buttercream. That was really tasty. Uh, macaroons as well. Uh, I had prepared a secret video toast for Abby. Uh, which had some folks from some of her favorite shows. It was the host of Temptation Island. It was uh, one of the co-hosts from Taskmaster. It was a judge from America's Next Top Model. It was a contestant from Survivor, uh, Rick Devins. Uh, it was the PA announcer for the Blues. It was who else? Oh, uh, uh, one of the actresses from Grey's Anatomy. So wait, 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 wait. wait they were actually doing this, or you, you were doing like impressions? No, no, no. I actually got went on Cameo and hired the, the vast majority of them to oh, give like a quick wedding cameo. greeting yeah. and edited it into a video. One of, them, one of them did it for free. Tell people what Cameo is. So Cameo is a website where a lot of mostly, to be fair, B and C list celebrities or D list. Steve uh, Gutenberg. Yeah, Steve Gutenberg. Uh, uh, David Hasselhoff is on there. Uh, Snoop Dogg at one point was on there, though I think is no longer taking requests. Uh, so you can hop on there and basically pay a certain amount. Uh, the, the ranges I had were anywhere from $10 to the most I paid was $75, uh, for a person to do a short video greeting of your choice, whether it's a birthday wish or a wedding wish or a whatever else. Uh, that was the majority of the videos I got. I did get one video that I had asked for on Twitter and, uh, Alex Horn from Taskmaster was kind enough to send a Twitter DM with his greeting. And, uh, yeah, it went beautifully. She loved it. Good reactions, moving toasts. We had our first dance. First dances are awkward, Sean. I'll just, I'll just throw that out there. Uh, super awkward, uh, yeah. but it was all lovely. It was beautiful. And then we went and jumped in the lake at, after it was all said and done about 945. So uh, not a not a super late night, but, you know, there were 12, 15 of us and uh, it was a great time. We overbought on alcohol, not a ton, not as many drinkers in my family uh, and not a lot of people down in booze. So our house is now stocked with excess beer and champagne and wine. Uh, I don't know when we'll get through that. I have been eating mostly wedding cake the last few days since coming back from this. Uh, I've also been napping a ton. Oh man, I've been so tired uh, all through today where I've just been wired instead. So yeah, that's my wedding time, Sean. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. I know you tuned in, uh, other folks tuned in and uh, hope you enjoyed. Well, I did tune in. I missed, uh, so even though it was only 18 minutes, I missed a good solid five minutes towards the end. I came back in time to see you uh, walk back out of the aisle. In my defense, I nearly sliced off the tip of my thumb. <laughs> what, what? So I had, I had it up in the kitchen. I was cooking dinner. Wait, I wasn't worthy of your full attention. I was just worthy well, of a multitask. So I had, it was this whole, I had it up and I have this brand new knife. Dang it. What's it called? It's a really nice Japanese knife. Anyway, it's from one of my, my favorite YouTube shows, Sam, the cooking guy, uh, a Nakiri knife. It's a, it's a seven inch Nakiri knife. It is beautiful. It is fantastic. And this was the first real time I was using it. I figured, hey, you know what? In honor of Alex and Abby's wedding, I'm going to use my Nakiri for the first time. That's absolutely not your thought process. Um, and I was cutting up some boneless, skinless chicken thigh. And I was, I think I was tearing up from, from the vows. And it distracted me. And I cut, a, I, I think I cut a chunk off the tip of my thumb. 
Uh, it didn't go through, but it was a good solid chunk. I put a compress on it real quick. It was yelling for Raquel. <laughs> um, she got me, she got me some super glue. So wait, wait, this is another detail in this story. <laughs> You're telling me Raquel wasn't watching. Uh, no, Raquel was not watching. Brutal. She had, she had. <laughs> This is not going to be a good enough excuse, whatever it is. She had a she had a scheduled counseling session that night. Still not good enough. Okay, well, and I know, and I know what you're thinking Sunday night, but she has this whole counselor that's been meeting with her on the phone pre pre COVID anyway. But uh, so it's been super glued, and you could you could see it there, Alex. I've had it bandaged for since Sunday, uh, and I think I think I'll be fine. It probably needs stitches. But I now, was Mariah watching? Yes, her and Chewie both were watching. Okay, good. But I can't count on either of them in a crisis, so that's why I had to call for Raquel. No, no, I get, I understand why you would have to do that. I'm very disappointed in Raquel, I should say. She was in a counseling session. No, I'm disappointed. I'm very disappointed. But it, you can watch it later. Can you? I don't know I would, how you would do that. Are you kidding? Is, is it available on that site? I should check. Probably. Wouldn't you want it? Wouldn't you want to know that you have? No, access I have. To it? I, I'm sure I have it somewhere. I just don't know if it's uploaded anywhere. Anyway, we can put it. We can put here it, nor there. You want to put it on the Duke's website or on the on the YouTube channel? We could we could do that if you want. I sure. Oh, I should like a riff track over it because so that's the problem is the audio is not good because you guys weren't mic'd. Right? I was mic'd. Oh, you were mic'd. I was mic'd. Abby was not because a, a mic would have looked really silly in a wedding dress. Okay, but she should have been mic'd because you can project. Sure. To her. Like when we used to do video, I was mic'd and you would just carry over. Yeah, yeah. No, that would have been the better approach from an audio perspective, but from a aesthetic, how do you look in your wedding dress perspective? Sure. Uh, I don't think a mic would have, would have been the best look for that. Should have had a boom. Or should have done like the theater style mics where it's like running through your hair. That would have been the other option. <laughs> anyway, that's my wedding. I'm married now. Uh, filed Congrats. the paperwork and everything. Thanks. Uh, we were super happy, but also super tired at the end of it. So I bet, uh, thanks to everyone for the well wishes and, uh, for, for the vast majority of you who, uh, who were invited and tuned in and, uh, no thanks to those who were uh, otherwise busy, man, <laughs> man, brutal Raquel, brutal. Uh, no. So as a result of that, I, I haven't been playing a ton of things recently. You haven't been playing a ton of things recently, but you did play enough of Imperial Struggle which after this word from our sponsors, you're going to be reviewing with our good buddy, Rory. So Alex, with all of the dark, gritty superheroes, you've got things like the Watchmen, you got things like the boys, all fantastic. But isn't it nice sometimes to just kind of snuggle into that nice, comfy blanket of superheroes are good guys and everything's you know, black and white, there's no gray. Wouldn't it be nice to just kind of live in that world where heroes can be heroes sometimes? I sure do love my my non-morally questionable hero, Sean. So, Alex, have you ever played a game called Sentinels of the Multiverse? I have played Sentinels of the Multiverse multiple times, both in on the table and in app form. Well, there is a brand new game coming out in the Sentinels comics world called Freedom 5, from our friends over at Arcane Wonders. Do you know anything about this game, Alex? Because I sure don't. I do, Sean. It's a cooperative strategy game in which one to five heroes race to protect the city from an onslaught of villainy. You can face standalone challenges or adventure through a series of campaign comics where you'll gain rewards and new threats every single session. Immerse yourself in the world of Sentinel Comics and test your wits against a dastardly smart AI in the newest evolution of the Defenders of the Realm series by Richard Launius with Adam and Brady Sadler. I just remembered all of that right off the top of my head. Wow, I'm really impressed, Alex. Maybe you have some sort of superhero ability, some sort of superpower that just lets you remember copy. So Alex, when is Freedom 5 coming out? How can people get their hands on this game? So this is coming to Kickstarter October 20th of 2020. And here's the thing, Sean. If you pledge early, if you go to freedom5game.com, freedomfivegame.com, you can sign up for a free hollow foil ability card set. It's going to be super cool. You're going to get more and more of them as the stretch goals increase. And uh, yeah, get in on this. This is a, a collaboration between Arcane Wonders 
and Greater Than Games, Freedom 5. You can check out Freedom 5 at that freedom5game.com website that Alex gave. You can also check out all of Arcane Wonders' other fantastic titles over at arcanewonders.com. Arcane Wonders, it's never a blunder when you go with Arcane Wonders. Well, Sean, in these in these uh, tricky times, our friends at Game Toppers want to let folks know that uh, they're they're still open for business. They're still doing what they can to provide some at home gaming goodness to help people upgrade their gaming experience while they're trapped at home. So, Late Pledge Manager is open on Game Toppers. They have a lot of great bundles on their website, uh, some of which might sell out. So, check it out before uh, before it gets too late. Uh, also, mats are going to be able to be shipped out relatively soon. So if that's something you've been looking for, hey, great. Thanks to Game Toppers for supporting the podcast and for supporting gamers looking to upgrade their gaming experience. So go visit them at GameToppersLLC.com. All right. Well, I'm here with Rory, the owner and proprietor of Empire Board Game Library. Hey, Rory, how you doing? I'm doing good. How's it going today, Sean? Pretty good. Welcome back. How many, how many times have you been on the podcast now, Rory? I think this is my third time. Oh, come on. Maybe That's fourth. It? I did two at your house. I did one live remote for... Dice for Telecom? Dice, no. Something. For uh, Extra Life. Oh, okay. Well, we've done a couple Extra Life things. Then. Yeah, maybe so. Well, Rory... They're, they are memorable, just so you know. Well, apparently not. So, Rory, you're here to help me review Imperial Struggle. You're you're my wargaming buddy, right? Right. I, we can kind of bring other people from, like, the Dukes group in uh, to some war games, but not consistently. You and I are the ones that, that really like doing the war game stuff, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, it's difficult to find people that want to play this style of war game, and these games are definitely a lot of fun. Yeah. But you're right it's difficult to get people to come play. So let's talk briefly about how Imperial Struggle plays, which is a bit of a challenge because I have now taught this game three and a half times and it's a good solid 40 to 45 minute rules teach. So I'm, I'm going to obviously don't want to take anywhere near that amount of time to explain it to the listeners out there, but I need to explain enough so that they can kind of have a framework as we're talking through the game. So, Imperial Struggle is the long-awaited successor to Twilight Struggle designed by Ananda Gupta and Jason Matthews from GMT Games. And this pits the British Empire against the French Empire from, I think it's like 1690 to 1787. Basically the 18th century. Yeah, the good chunk of the 18th century kind of culminating with, with the American Revolution. And so you have this nice big map on the board that has... Four featured areas. It has North America, Europe, India, and then the Caribbean and also kind of the southern part of uh, the colonies, the American colonies. And on all of these different continental areas, there are some spaces of different types. There are political spaces, there are economic spaces, there are military spaces, which includes ports and forts, and then there's also uh, territories. Now, each space has a different icon and a different shape that's associated with it uh, that is the, the easy key for how you're going to interact with all of them. What I will say is this, that the three main types of spaces are economic, political, and military. Those can be interacted with during the normal seven peace turns of the game. The game's divided into seven peace turns. And then in very limited capacities, these square territories can be interacted with on the four war turns that are kind of spread throughout the peace turns kind of a little little bit uh difficult to wrap your head around but all right so what I'm you're not try- really sure how the listener is following you on this one but you're doing a great job thank you perfect this is a tug of war style game kind of like twilight struggle where the point counter the victory point counter starts in the middle and it's actually at 15 and the british will win if they can drag it all the way to the zero the french will win if they can drag it all the way to 30 and so there are different points throughout each round when you could be scoring points either through various uh, card play or through evaluating control of each of the four continents or through evaluating the three commodities uh, that are in play that particular turn, which I'll explain in a little bit more depth in a bit. Now, there are some other ways where you can win immediately. So, for example, if you manage to uh, 
score all of the VPs for the four continents at the end of a round, uh, end of a peace turn. And if you're able to score uh, all of the commodities, you will immediately win. We have yet to see that. Um, if there is no clear winner at the end of the game, then you're going to add up some end game stuff. And whichever side that the victory point counter winds up on, that's going to be the winner. So that's kind of the framework. So let's talk about the peace rounds because the peace turns, because those are uh, the biggest part of the game in one sense. So we're going to take four, uh, four turns four rounds in this turn. I guess we need to be clear. Turn is the, the peace turn. That's the big structure. And within that turn, there are four rounds that you and I alternate taking. And to take our rounds action, we're going to choose one of nine investment tiles. So unlike Twilight Struggle, where it's primarily card play that's deciding how you're, you're taking your actions, it's choosing these investment tiles. And on these investment tiles, there's a major action and a minor action. The major action can be split up, divided, um, however you want. The minor action can only do one thing with it. Additionally, there may be some other things. There could be an upgrade to the military as part of this investment tile. Uh, there could also be an event played as part of the particular investment tile that you choose. But generally, if these other things are present, then the numerical strength of the major action is going to be less, typically. So, so what does this look like? Well, there are three types of actions you could take, uh, either major or, or minor. There's the political action, the economic action, and the military action. So the political action is going to let you interact with the, with the map, either taking off your opponent's flags that are uh, on a particular spot or putting your own on. Um, the economic action will do the same, but specifically on market spaces. And then finally, the military action has a little bit more uh, options. It can let you deploy squadrons, uh, naval squadrons from the Navy box to uh, out, out into play. It could also let you build more squadrons. It costs four points of military to build a new squadron. It also lets you build forts. It can also let you sort of get rid of unrest, there's these conflict markers that get placed that uh, eliminate uh, some of your presence out on the board so you could spend military to, to quell the unrest, get rid of the conflict markers. So lots of different things that you can do with the military. So basically, as part of your turn, you're choosing how to spend your major action points, how to spend your minor action points, and the really cool thing is you can augment those actions by taking on debt. So let's say that I choose a four political major action and I want to spend two debt. I now have six points of politics and I could split that up. I can do four, two, three, three, and I'm spending that again to maybe I'm spending it to remove spots where you're on the map or spots where I'm on the map, I'm adding to it. Um, so it's a pretty interesting system there. So I also mentioned that there's event play. Some of those investment tiles will let you play an event, and, and the events are cards that you have in your hand. You will typically only have three events in your hand uh, at the start of a turn, and the events often will need to be tied to a certain type of major action on the investment tile that you're taking, but not always. And there's an action that you'll take, and there might also be a bonus action if you have met certain prerequisites, and I'll tell you what that is. And these events are pretty big uh, because they, they can be pretty, uh, pretty far-reaching effects, pretty powerful effects. And I think it's smart play of the events um, with the actions that you're taking, along with your ministry cards, which is something we haven't talked about yet either. Lots of moving pieces here, wouldn't you say, Rory? Yes, definitely. And these cards, by the way, they get more and more powerful as the game progresses through. Yeah, so the ministry cards are... Um, something that lets you set the course of play for your particular empire. You have a deck of ministry cards that are unique to the French, unique to the British, and they will, uh, you will choose at the start of each era, which two you want in play. You choose them secretly. And then as you use their, their powers, they'll get flipped. Some of their powers have, uh, again, some, some game changing effects. Other times there's just a keyword that's on them that will affect the play of certain events. Uh, in other words, it might say governance, which might let you get the bonus off of an event card that says, if you have the governance uh, uh, keyword, then you get the bonus effect on this as well. Um, also, they can help, those keywords can help in certain wars. So, after we've both taken our four 
action rounds and a peace turn, we're now going to evaluate basically who has more flags in each continent. Um, the continent VPs are random. There's eight different VP chits, and we're going to randomly deal out four. And then in the next peace turn, we're going to deal out the other four, shuffle them up, and then do that for the subsequent rounds. So the points might be zero points for this region, uh, one point for this region, two points for this region, but they also can give you treaty points. Remember we talked about debt before. Treaty points are something you can earn that can get spent as in as debt can be spent, basically, which is which is kind of interesting. So whoever's winning each of these regions, we're then moving the victory point tracker accordingly. Then we evaluate the three commodities I mentioned earlier. So there are six commodities in the game. There is sugar, spice, tobacco, furs, fish, and coffee. Coffee. And cotton. Yes, I mentioned five. You got the six. There we go. Um, so these are also determined randomly. And when I say randomly, I mean completely randomly because you could, by sheer luck, have the exact same three commodities get flipped over every single game turn. Um, hasn't happened. Hasn't happened, no, but, I'm, but, it, but it could. And so certain markets on the board are going to be aligned with certain types of commodities. So th- some of the North American Market spots are going to be for fur and fish. You're going to have tobacco and uh, tobacco and tobacco and uh, sugar in the Caribbean, and then you're going to have cotton and spices in India. Yes. There are no markets in Europe. Europe is exclusively political spots. So you're going to evaluate who has control of more markets of each of those three commodities. You're going to score some points based on that. There's also some other things you might get, like treaty points, or even take on uh, debt, because it, it's just how the game plays. Um, all right, so that's how a peace turn resolves. Now, sprinkled throughout the seven peace turns at predetermined times are these four war turns. Um, each war has four, except for the last war, which has only three theaters, that are uh, basically specific wars, like it's the war of, uh, Austrian succession, the War of Spanish Succession, um, the Seven Years' War, and then the American War of Independence. And there are particular theaters associated with each war. And you're putting out these chits that have assigned a certain strength on them. You know what's on your side. Your opponent knows what's on their side, but you don't necessarily know what's on each other. There are actions that you can take during the peace turns that can let you augment your power on these spots. And then we're going to resolve one... Um, one theater at a time, flip over my power, your power. There's some alternate effects that some of the tiles might have. And then we're going to also add who has certain alliance spots and predetermined spots um, on the map. So, for example, if we're doing um, one of the wars where the theaters in Europe, there are certain alliance spots that are going to contribute to your strength. So maybe I have three strength for my chits. Rory, you only have one strength, but you have these three particular alliance spots which now makes it four to three, you're going to beat me by one, you're going to win that particular theater. There are different tiers, different thresholds by which you can win a theater. The more you win a theater, the more of an effect you're going to get in terms of VP. Also, if you win by enough of a threshold, you're going to get conquest points, which is the only way to interact with certain territories, which is that fourth type of spot, which you can't interact with normally during peace turns. Pretty big effects here. Um, I think the one thing we'd added, if there's a small catch-up mechanic, and that is you gain treaty points if you're behind in the war. Right. Um, it's it's helpful, but it, it's, it's certainly small. helpful. Yeah. So that's pretty much the game. Seven peace turns, four war turns interspersed throughout. The American War of Independence, which Rory, you haven't seen, can be pretty interesting because it has the potential of completely removing the British from North America, but doesn't mean that they've lost at that point. Um, but that's kind of how you play. Hopefully that's enough of an overview for people to, um, follow a bit along with what we say when we're talking about the game. So Rory, how long has Imperial struggle been on your radar before it came out? It's been on my radar for at least a year. Yeah. Yeah. I've been following the design diary of, uh, of the designers of this on BGG for a while. And I've been eagerly awaiting this. I think I, I could probably check one IP 500 is. Um, cause IP 500 this game, mm-hmm. uh, which is GMT's like pre-order system. So when they have 500 people committed to pre-order it, that's when it goes off to the, to the printer. Um, 
you're a fan of Twilight Struggle. Absolutely. Uh, so same designers as Twilight Struggle. It's all, always been kind of billed as the spiritual successor to Twilight Struggle, even though there have been other games like 1960, Making the President, uh, 1989, which is kind of in that in that vein with some of the same designers. I think, I forget which one of them. I don't think they were both on it. Um, but I've had high expectations for this game since, since before it came out. What about you? Absolutely. I had high expectations, and honestly, this game maybe exceeded those. It was unexpectedly great game. Okay. Well, so let's, uh, let's talk about the rule book. Rory, how did you learn this game? Well, I'd like to thank Sean for doing a complete rules overview and teach on this game. Our first game was, we, was problematic. I think we missed yes. a couple rules. Uh, of course, it, the rules that we missed shifted towards Sean's favor, and he won the game. That's not correct, but go on. There's a huge asterisk on that. Um, the second game, and I have to, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna be straight with you. This game, there is a lot of moving parts. Um, for me, it was difficult to keep track of the wars that were coming on because there's just so many other things going on in addition to the wars. So the second game we played, I wasn't following the wars very well, and I ended up losing it because of that. Um, the third game I played was not with Sean, and I did much better on the third game, but it really took me two games to wrap my head around the rules. Yeah, so one of the things that I do with a lot of GMT games is I will spend a lot of time uh, watching YouTube videos, watching playthroughs. Um, there's, there's a handful of really good YouTubers out there that will spend time doing that, and there's like really difficult games like Empire of the Sun, which I probably spent like 15, 20 hours like just prepping to play. Like pretty wild stuff. This game, because we started playing it right when it came out off the P500 list, uh, there wasn't much of that out there. What GMT does a lot of times, though, is, is in addition to a rule book, there's also a playbook that they include. And the, there's usually a tutorial that you can either read through or you could set up the game and read through the tutorial and move the pieces around as you do it, which is what I did. That's the first thing that I did. Um, and so you'll read through that. It might reference certain rules. Then you go and read that particular rule book. And then I went and I read the rule book and I, with the context of, of how all this stuff works. And here's the thing with GMT rules. They're really tough a lot of the times. Um, they use this sort of outline method, which for uh, non-war gamers is a little off-putting, I think. Um, as someone who reads statutes and reads bylaws and reads uh, contracts where there's this outline format, like it clicks really well for me, but there's still a lot of dense stuff here. Like, mm -hmm. um, what I will say is I think that this rule book, even for a GMT rule book is a little rough. Um, and I think it's going to very much benefit from a second or third printing and some rules revisions along with that. This was not a great rule book. There were some, we had some issues. There are two different ways to kind of upgrade slash replace war tiles that I, I confused and we didn't correct that until like my fourth game of it and your third game, which was with, not with me. Right. Um, so I, I think a lot of times these benefit from, from second printings, third printings, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I, it is, it is what it is. So, all right, Rory, let's talk about art and components. What did you think about art and components? Oh, uh, the map, the map on this game is gorgeous. It's a beautiful map with four, with four spears. Um, I, I thought the map, I thought the components were, were, were really good. I mean, I feel like GMT always produces pretty decent games. Well, so you would be, you, that's in opposition to what Alex would say. So I actually, when I first talked about this game on the podcast, I showed him an image of this map because I think the map is gorgeous. Yeah, like, agreed. I think it looks beautiful. It's this like old world map. Uh, it, it's really functional too. Um, it's like, you know, the aged parchment type thing. I thought it was beautiful. I showed it to Alex and he was thoroughly unimpressed. Unimpressed. Interesting. So yeah, I, I, I found that I found that kind of odd. Now, I mean I think I think GMT from from non war gamers gets a bad rap because sometimes it's paper mats, sometimes there's not even a mounted board. It's a million little cardboard chit counters. Um they have I think they have certain productions. Like I just picked up two from you tonight, which people can't see right now, but that's okay. There's 
Rhode Island, which is volume nine of the Battles of the American Revolution uh, series. With, and with the bonus game. With the bonus game. Newport. And, and it's just this hex map um, that just looks, I mean, I think it looks exciting, but I can certainly understand how this looks terrible and dry to many gamers, right? Yeah, agreed. And then uh, The Hunted, another GMT tile, title, which is a one to two player game, although I hear it's best solo. It's about Twilight of the U-Boats, 1943, 1945. And all that's on the back of the box is a bunch of charts. <laughs> Extremely interesting. <laughs> like, I'm super excited for these, but they don't, like, they're not enticing to the uninitiated. They're not something that, I mean, I get why GMT gets this rap from Alex amongst other gamers. But you look at Twilight, excuse me, look at Imperial Struggle, um, and I encourage people to go look at the, the box art. I think it looks great. I, like, I agree. This is like a step above a lot of the other GMT titles. I feel like the board looks like a nautical map. Yeah. Um, from, the, from the 18th century. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's really impressive. I mean, it's, it's a much better production of the board than most GMT games. I will definitely admit that. I agree. I agree. Um, and then also, like, all of the, the ministry cards and the, uh, the event cards, they've got old, like, paintings. Not to say pictures, but, yeah, they're all paintings, essentially, of, uh, or sketches, whatever, of the historical events, which yeah. is something I like, which we'll kind of talk about more, more in theme. But it definitely, um, I, I don't know. I think, it's a, I think it's a really solid production. Yeah, I agree. All right, well, let's talk a little bit then about the gameplay, Rory. So what were, what were some of the things that you enjoyed playing Imperial Struggle? I thought once I, once I got the rules, I thought, it, I thought it was just there were so many moving parts and there were so many things to think about, and the decisions were so tough. I mean, every tile that you grab, you really have to make exactly the right decision because if you drop the ball on a military, then all of a sudden you start to fail in the wars. If you're not paying attention to the commodities, then all of a sudden you're losing points in the, in the scoring round for commodities. I just felt like there was just so much going on, but it all sort of seamlessly came together after a couple, after a couple plays. Sure. So what I'll say is after, after having gone through the tutorial, after having read the rule book, um, my first thought was this is nothing like twilight struggle. I mean, there's some, some basic shared DNA two empires, two superpowers, um, you know, competing this tug of war, competing over different regions on the board that's there. But then the action selection system is completely different. Uh, there's no dice whatsoever. There's no like random randomness other than how you're distributing the VPs for the regions and which commodities you're, you're pulling. And then also which card, but there's no dice rolling, like dice rolling. That's, that's Twilight Struggle is all dice rolling, but setting yourself up for you know mitigation of of that luck this has none of that um and it's and it's pretty it's pretty interesting but my first thought was this is mechanically a simpler game than twilight struggle um despite having taken four or five minutes to teach the rules i still felt like it was um there there, there was less less complexity to the rules like in twilight struggle you have to worry about um you have to worry about the nuclear track, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, or sorry, the, um, the DEF CON track. Uh, there's the space race. There's how do you do a realignment rule? What are all of the dice roll modifiers that you need to figure out? How do you conduct a coup? How do you, um, it, lots of stuff. And then how the, do you the understand point. the cards. Yeah, exactly. And so I felt like, I was like, oh, this is going to be a much simpler game. And I don't think it was as easy to recognize how much depth is in this game right off the bat. So much so that I think it is, while it's, it's mechanically and rules-wise simpler, I think it might be a more deep, a deeper game than Twilight Struggle. Yeah, I agree. I think that one major difference between Twilight Struggle and Imperial Struggle is, is Twilight Struggle has a mass appeal to yeah. both war gamers and regular gamers as well. I feel like Imperial Struggle is going to have less appeal to that normal gaming crowd and more appeal to the war gamer crowd. Yeah, I think so. And I think when we talk about theme, we might kind of tease that idea out a bit. Um, but I, I agree with you 
which is too bad because I, I think this is probably the better game. And, and I, I say that having Twilight Struggle on my top 10 of all time list for several years. Um, I've played it uh, at least a dozen times in real life. I've played it at least 50 times on my iPad or on my computer on Steam. I, I love Twilight Struggle. A big part of that's the theme. And, and I love the gameplay too, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's a top 10 game for me. Yeah. Um, but there is a certain... <sighs> There is a certain depth to this game. Let me put it this way. Twilight Struggle, there's a certain way to play. It, there's a certain scriptedness to it because yeah. of because of because it's a card driven game, because there's early war, mid war, late war cards. You you are playing towards certain events. You know, I can't, as the American player, I can't invest too heavily into Egypt because there's a particular Russian event that might come up that's gonna just wipe me out in Egypt. Totally. So you have to you have to play around that. Um and then also when the certain scoring cards come up, that's random, but you also are kind of, you know, okay, I know in this particular turn, uh, Central America, South America, and Africa are coming into play, so I need to start preparing for that. Here, that scriptedness is gone. Yep. Because you've got the random flip of the region VPs. You've got the uh, random commodities that come up every round. So that that scripted play is gone that in some ways makes this a little bit more open for new players somewhat mm. yeah i mean i definitely think someone who's played several times is going to have a huge huge advantage but i think you can still kind of comfortably explore it um unlike in twilight struggle there's just a certain way you, you carry out the first couple turns i I completely agree. I mean, you you know what's coming in Twilight Struggle. That that's the big one. Right. This one, this one, I feel like this one kind of starts you off a little bit, a little bit slower, and then it ramps up tremendously as the game goes on. And there are some similarities similarities between the two. I mean, Europe plays a, a big part of this game in the wars. Uh, it and it plays a bigger role later in the game. Sort of like Twilight Struggle does the same thing with Europe. If you don't pay attention to Europe, you're not going to win. Right, um, and I feel like the push pull point system it feels very similar to the two games, but and maybe some of the territorial control is similar as well. But after mm-hmm. that, they're very different games. Yeah, what's interesting is the big concept behind Twilight Struggle was the interconnectedness of the different countries and the the domino effect. Right, like as soon as you put influence in. Iran, that's going to give you access to Afghanistan, which will give you access to India and Pakistan, etc. But this doesn't have this as much. So, like, for example, in Europe, there nothing's connected in Europe because mm-hmm. it's just alliance spots. And so you're sending out envoys, ambassadors, letters, correspondence, whatever. While in North America, there is some interconnectedness, same with the with the Caribbean and India, but less so in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um and it's, it's the, this idea that there's three different currencies, right? In Twilight Struggle, you just have one. You have the, the points. You can spend them to do your coups, to do your, your realignment roles, placing influence, whatever. Here, though, you're having to choose between political actions, economic actions, and military actions, which creates interesting decision points. Um, but also, the way that each region is set up feels very different. So, like I said, Europe only has political spaces uh, with the exception of two, uh, two naval squadron spots. Mm-hmm. Um, the rest of it's all political spots. And there's something we didn't talk about in the rules, but if you have political access, um, certain political spots in Europe, it's going to give you access to these advantage tiles. Um, and this is true in other regions too, but Europe has the bulk of them. Yeah. These advantage tiles can be used usually once per, uh, once per turn, full turn, and they let you do things like put conflict markers out, or they might reduce your debt, or uh, they might let you um, bun- bunch of different bunch of different stuff uh, reduce costs to uh, flip uh, uh, to flip flags and things like that. And so there's you can kind of approach the scheme from a brute force perspective, but once you figure out the interplay of what are your ministry cards, how are those interacting with the event cards that you've drawn? And how is it interacting with the various advantage tiles that you've maneuvered yourself to get? 
um, it's a it's a ne- next level of play. I agree, especially with the advantage tiles. I think that they're they're very interesting because you can get an advantage tile, but then I can come in and unflag that territory, take over that territory, and take that advantage tile back away from you again. Right. So it's kind of got that push pull of that territory where you can get that advantage tile, and having a lot of advantage tiles uh, is 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 really interesting in the game. Yeah. They can do they can do a lot of things. Yeah, and it's nice that they limit it because you can only use two advantage tiles per round, and even then only one advantage tile per region. Yeah. So I can't use two in India, and I or I can't use three. So it limits it because I, to ignore um, to ignore the political spots means you're losing out on advantages, which is bad. But it's this whole balance of I've got to care about the military. Um, I've got to care about the markets. I've got to care about the political spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of a lot of competing interests here, and it's very easy to like get tunnel vision and focus oh, yeah. on something, and then forget about all these other things. It's 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 a it's a great point. Like you can just get obsessed over the war, and then all of a sudden you may win parts of that war, but then you're going to lose different parts of the commodity through all four regions, or three regions. And you possibly aren't going to come ahead on that round at all. Yeah. So you really have to, like I said, your decisions are very critical in this game. And you have to, you have to play a balancing act between what you want to accomplish during a turn round. Absolutely. I think one of the things I really like about this game is the debt. So you both start off with a debt limit of seven. You have zero debt, but a debt limit of seven, which means that on your, on your rounds, your action rounds, you can spend as much debt as you want up to your debt limit to augment those actions. So if you want to, in your first round, take a four political investment tile and add six debt to it and spend 10 points, you can totally have that. That's terrible. Don't do that, but you can, um, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of events in the game that punish you for having more debt or having, uh, less available debt than your opponent. And so you, you want to be spending debt in order to make sure you can do all the things you want to do, but you don't want to be outpacing the debt spending too much, which I think is a really, a really cool mechanic. And I think kind of ties in thematically because that can be I think it feels true to the age. Right. So I really like that. And I also like that kind of catch up you talked about before with the treaty points that you can earn through some of the commodities and also, uh, as, as. Um, uh, second place for for losing the wars. So, um, so let's talk about the wars, Rory, because you are not great with the wars. Well, I have to admit, I was much better on my third game with the wars. Okay. Um, one thing about what we didn't talk about is that on the board itself, you can actually see when the wars are coming up by the little pips next to the whatever the hexagon. I guess it would be the hexagon areas, mostly in Europe. Yeah. Uh, so you can see if it's going to be the first war, second war, or third war, or fourth war. Um, and I realized after my second play that I should pay a lot more attention to those. Yeah. Um, and then, but it, like I said, there's a lot going on in this game. So I feel like everybody's first couple of plays, you're not going to wrap your head around every aspect of this game. Sure. Um, but I feel after you get a couple of plays, it completely makes sense. Um, and, and, I definitely found myself really paying attention to the reference guide uh, for each war that was coming up, just so I could at least keep it on the radar of where the territories I need to control and what I need to be looking after. But even with that being said, you still can't put all your eggs in that basket. So right. that's what makes this game so amazing, is there's just so many different facets going on to this game that you have to pick what you think is going to be the right, the right path to win. Mm-hmm. And that changes on every round. Yeah. I think it's in many ways it while there's a strategic long-term approach to the game, it is very tactical and everything's interconnected. Like that's the crazy part. Um, for example, having the political spaces gives you access to certain advantages that lets you place out conflict markers, which is going to potentially eat up military actions of your opponent because they're trying to get rid of those conflict markers, but also having conflict markers out might help you in the war because that's, worth additional points towards determining the threshold of, of victory in the war. Um, 
and like you mentioned with with Europe, um, Europe is it's wild, right? Because it's not just one necessarily one space to control per country. Some of them have one, some of them have two, some of them have four. So, like for example, Spain and Austria, those are like the next two big powers, and so each of those have four different spots. Now, some of those spots are alliance spots that are going to contribute to the war. Some of those spots are these prestige points, uh, prestige spots, which we didn't really talk about because there's a second way that Europe scores. In addition to just uh, just scoring the chit every round, or excuse me, every turn, um, whoever has the most of these green spots in Europe is going to get an additional two victory points. So you're saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest some political points in Austria but do I want to put them on the the alliance spot that's going to help me in the coming war? Or do I want to put them on the pre- prestige spot, which is going to help me try and win that prestige victory in Europe at the end of this round? And those are difficult decisions. Or do I want to put them on the spot that's going to give me access to one of the advantage tiles, yep. which isn't uh, typically isn't a prestige spot and isn't an alliance spot. And so there's a lot of difficulty there. But ultimately, you have, I think, in the wars, the potential for some of the biggest swings. So most of the wars have like two or three different thresholds, different tiers of victory. And so like if you win a particular theater by one point or two points, I might get a point and you'll probably get nothing. But if you win by like four or five, you're going to score like two or three points and then you're going to get a a, um, conquest point or maybe two conquest points which are going to give you access to these special territory spaces or potentially make it so you can take out uh, a British or a French territory in a particular continent that might cut off their access to that continent without some really difficult work on their part. Mm -hmm. And so there could be some pretty big swings here that you really got to be on the lookout for. Yeah, Um, definitely agree. So how many times have you played the game now, Rory? Three times. Three times. Okay. I have played... Three, three times as well. Um, and then kind of a half time where I helped you and uh, I forget the other gentleman's name. Mike. Mike, yeah. Dojo Mike. Dojo Mike, okay. So I've played this with Raquel. We played this on my birthday. Uh, we played all the way to the end. Got some rules wrong, uh, but we played all the way to the end. I was the British. She was the French. I lost the War of Independence, American War of Independence. Got com- completely kicked out of North America but I still won uh, at the end of the game by points. I played this again with you. Uh, no, did we and I play twice? You played twice. We played twice. So I've played this four times now. Um, first game, how did we win the first game? How did I win the first game with you? I think you won the first game through points. Well, yeah, and through I think points. we made it through the, we into the third war. Yeah. Uh, so, but I think it was, oh, I just, I the destroyed this, you in the wars. The like second it was, game, I lost basically because I ran my debt up too high and you scored a bunch of points in the second war. Yeah. A bunch and of points ended in the, the game. War. It was kind of a weird, it was kind of a weird game. It was an event card. So I did an event card that said, if I have more available debt than my opponent, I score X points. And I was at the 28th and scored two points and one in the middle of a piece. Turn. Yeah. Um, well, then the middle, it still checks at the end of the game or the end of the, the peace turn, but it was enough, more than enough. Wow. That's a lot of, that's a lot of. We are in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and this is what it sounds like. That's central, central. So, yeah. <laughs> now, the, now my third game, yeah. I did go all the way to the American War. I actually made it, we made it all the way through. It was a very tight game all the way to the end. Oh, okay. we didn't, but we didn't, we didn't, uh, Dojo Mike won barely at the very end. We didn't have to go into final scoring. So I still haven't seen what final scoring okay. looks like. Okay. Um, and then my fourth game was actually online with Ellie, and we played uh, with Vassal, the online thing, which you need to you need to pick up. I mean, online, like computer games isn't really your thing yeah. for the most part, right? It's, it's not. I definitely prefer on the table looking at people and interacting with people. Sure. But, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool module um, on Vassal. And so it's, it's a good way to kind of learn the game, play solo. It doesn't teach you how to play or anything like that, but it's pretty cool. Ellie and I played, um, we did it over two nights. Uh, actually, I did a rules overview with him that took 45 minutes. Had to do like a share screen and everything. 
And then we played the first round in First War, and it was bad. It was super bad. And so I said, let's let's call it a night. Let's come back in a couple days, and we'll start over now that you kind of see how it. So you reset it? it. We reset it because okay. it would have been bad. It would have been like I had like complete dominance over Europe, and just yeah. it was bad. Um, and then we got, uh, I think we got the second war and I just, I, again, just racked up the points. I think by that fourth play, I definitely had enough understanding of not only what I should be doing, but also what I should be watching out for Yeah, on the other side too. And, and that's, that's just kind of card knowledge that, yeah. that still applies in, in twilight struggle. Um, and so when I said earlier that a new player has a better chance in an Imperial struggle against an experienced player than those same players would have in twilight struggle. I still stand by that, but it's still not great. Mm-hmm. Um, and definitely like when I played with Ellie, I was definitely kind of walking him through like, here are things I could do. Here are things you might want to watch out for. Here's what I recommend. Mm-hmm. Um, there definitely needs to just like with, with, with twilight struggle, I think there needs to be a, a kind of, teaching not just of how to play but why you're you're doing the things you're doing there's no doubt i think the first play needs to be kind of a walkthrough a couple of wars and things to look out for war things to pay attention to and i still even on my on my third play i still struggle with timing and triggers on some of the card actions sure especially towards the the end towards the end of the game when they really start to ramp up because the cards get really powerful towards the end um and it's something I'm I, I'm looking forward to the next play. I, now I feel like I have a better handle on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the theme because you mentioned earlier that you think that Twilight Struggle probably has more broad appeal because of that Cold War theme, and I agree with you 100. percent I feel like for me, the 18th century history. I, okay. I remember learning about it in like early grade school and then like sixth grade and then middle school and high school. And it was always like, let's rush through the hundred years before the American revolution. We'll talk about it in a couple of weeks and then we'll spend like months on the American revolution. Yeah. And so I remember like hearing about the war, the Austrian war of succession and hearing about the Spanish war of succession and like the seven years war, but not really spending a lot of time on them. Even in like world history class, yeah. It was, let's rush up to the War of Independence. Um, and so it's thematically, I feel more disconnected than the Cold War. I mean, we lived through the tail end of the Cold War. Yep. You a little bit more than, than I. A little bit. Um, and, but also, like, that was one of my favorite, when I, was a, when I was a history teacher, that was my favorite unit. I had this Cold War unit that I did. Um, I loved reading books on the, on the Cold War and, and movies in the Cold War. Like, I just love that history. Yeah, definitely. And then I think about this. You're, you're totally right about the history. Like, I don't know a whole lot about the 18th century history, but playing through this game, I have definitely learned a lot about that history, and it's really interesting stuff. And then, yeah. and then you kind of wish, like, I wish we would have dove a little deeper in school because right. I find myself now as an adult wishing I knew more about that timeline in history. Right. And what's nice is there's, uh, in the playbook, uh, there's a bunch of information in the back. I've started reading through some of that historical information, like walks you through, like, for example, in the back of the box, there's uh, Samuel Johnson. He gives uh, the scholarship keyword to the British. And then it says the award for Europe is worth one extra VP to you and one less VP to France. Why? I don't know. But it's there in the back of the book. You can read, you know, what yeah. was his influence um, well, GMT, British history. GMT is really good about that in general with their games. Right. Their history education uh, for wars are excellent, always. Yeah. I mean, that's to me, that's, that's one of the things I like about these games is it lets you take a bit of, um, a, bit of a look into history without just necessarily sitting down and reading a book. But, and again, this isn't a simulation, right? Like, this doesn't right. compare to being one of the British rulers, one of the French monarchs. Um, but it kind of, it, I don't know, it gives you a look into it, a peek into it. Yeah, I completely agree. So um, I thought overall, despite being slightly less interested in this theme than Twilight Struggle, I still felt like it was a very thematic game. I, I agree with you on that. I thought it was very thematic too. Um, I mean, I thought there was just a lot of tension 
um, and it just kind of it really feels like you're really preparing for these different battles and you get a sense of the timeline you get a sense of the history um, right. I agree so like you didn't get a chance to play Europe Divided although that was kind of on your radar um, we reviewed it a couple months back and it was post Cold War Europe struggle between Western Europe and 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 uh, Russia and it to me there was just zero theme like just nothing came through in the theme even though I was somewhat familiar with the history it's the last 25 30 years um, but this game had just a ton of theme for me yeah like and I haven't played that one but I think you said that one felt more abstract I thought so or this one doesn't feel abstract at all no not not at all not at all well let's uh let's go over to the guild to hear what some of our guild members had to say so Eric Booth said I've played Imperial Struggle and to me it is barely comparable to Twilight Struggle really like both games but I had an easier time wrapping my head around Imperial Struggle that's not what I read in some of the comments with board game geek in fact it's normally it seems like the comments are the other way around people well, struggle with the rule book yeah I, I i i see what he's saying from one perspective like i said i think it's mechanically simpler and i was ready i was kind of ready to go i even now i still feel like i'm constantly having to check the player aid and twilight struggle for like a what are all the bonuses on the um, realignment rules? Like, I think I know most of them, but I always feel like I have to double check. Uh, what, what is a coup again for the 30th time? Um, so I, I think that I was kind of off to the races much faster mechanically. But like I said, I feel like it's a deeper game in, in a lot of ways. And then Josh Inger says, I have still, this, is, so this isn't about Imperial Struggle, just kind of an interesting little anecdote. Uh, I have still never actually played Twilight Struggle, except for going through the app tutorial. Not exactly my type of game and a bit intimidated by the experienced players. But the name on the box originally caught my eye because years ago, I went to college with Ananda Gupta and we were in the gaming club together. He was one, uh, he was the one to introduce the Siedler von Canton, the uh, Settlers of Canton, and other 90s Euros to us just before their English releases and plenty of good memories playing games with him so it helped me reconnect with an old friend online that's kind of cool yeah and then francois maillie says or maillie sorry francois um imperial struggle such an amazing game the limited actions make for an incredibly tense game the three random markets make for nice variation and focus every round and it gets rid of the problem i had with twilight struggle when you get stuck with too many scoring cards the theme comes through very strongly the rules are not the best, but good enough. I didn't think I would find it so much better than Twilight Struggle. This is a contender for game of the year. Six out of six for me. That's, that's pretty pretty good words. That that's pretty that's pretty good. There's and a lot of things I agree with on that too. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. So like for example, um the, the scoring cards, the scoring in Twilight Struggle is kind of random because the scoring cards, when you score Europe, you score Central America, Africa, whatever. They're mixed into the deck, and when they come into your hand, they have to get played at the end of that, that game turn. But that also limits what you can do, because you have less cards that you can play as actions. On one hand, you have that knowledge that your opponent doesn't, hand, uh, or doesn't have, but sometimes when I have the Africa card, and you see, Rory, that I'm going heavy on Africa actions, you're like, oh, he's got the Africa card. Yeah. Right? You can kind of yeah. you can kind of tell. I don't like that about Twilight Struggle actually. Well, no, and I do too. Yeah. And that's what makes them very different games, and I definitely like that aspect too. But I like that you just you know everything's going to score. Now, it could be that that North America this round is only worth 0 points and 1 treaty point. Uh, but it, it but it could be a focus, right? Right. Uh, because also maybe both fish and furs came up as the commodities but it's also worth zero points just from the region perspective. And so, you know, well, I can't just completely ignore North America because these commodities are, are definitely in play. Um, so yeah, it, interesting thoughts. I think it sounds like both of us are kind of in line with, with Francois on that. Yeah. Agreed. All right. So let's do our final thoughts. So as Francois alluded to, he's giving this a six out of six. 
We rate everything here, uh, the Dukes of Dice, on a six-point scale. A one is uh, just a terrible, terrible game. Six is a contender for the top ten. Rory, what are your final thoughts, and then how would you rate this game on our six-point scale? Well, I think one of my, I think this is one of the best war games that's been out in years. I think it's, I think it's up there. Like you know, you always know it's a good game when you play a game, and you just can't wait to get that game back on the table. And you think about everything that happened in that game and how you're going to change your strategy and what you're going to be playing closer attention to. And I think this game absolutely did that. Um, I feel like this game is up there with Paths of Glory, um, Combat Commander. Uh, and I think that it's one that I would, I would give it a 5 out of 6 and possibly a 6 out of 6 with a couple more plays. The more the, It seems like every time I play it, I wrap my head around a little bit more concepts and understanding of the game a little bit better and it just gets better for me and so rory a five is a great game will rarely turn down a play of it so does that sound right definitely it, so possibly a contender for the top 10 so it's maybe a contender a six. for a six in the top game of the year okay yeah so i would say for me this is definitely the one to beat for game of the year like this is this is really amazing i was excited for this i knew i would like it um, I didn't, I didn't expect to like it more than Twilight Storm. Though. I really didn't. And, and that's again, taking into account the fact that I like the theme in Twilight Struggle better, but like the gameplay here, I mean, this is, this is what, 10 years, 12 years later, when did Twilight Struggle come out? Um, it's been, it's been a while. Probably close to 10 years now. And this feels like, um, increase in design level skill taking into account uh development and how games you know new games that, that have come out um this is just a very refined design that i don't think i don't think they would have designed or, or even maybe could have designed back then this is them taking something from twilight struggle taking lessons that they've had over you know 10 a dozen different games whatever between the two of them um and creating just a really solid game. Yes. A re- I mean, I, I, I don't know. There may be some thematic connection between how this game is played and how and, and the theme here, the 18th century France and Britain. I don't know to what extent something like this, like if you could, if you could take this game and, and update Twilight Struggle with some of the gameplay here. I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as the gameplay is concerned, this is amazing. Like, yep. It's really solid. And so for me, I have to give this a six. Um, it, I think I, it's a fair, fair I, I, score. I like it better than Twilight Struggle. Twilight Struggle has literally been on my top ten list for several years. I, I've i played Twilight Struggle twice since having played this game in the last couple months. Um, and I still love Twilight Struggle. and But I just I, I think this is a better game. And I'm, I'm shocked. I'm How do you think that. this compares to the other war games we play? Um, uh, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, from from like a, as a grand strategic game, you would compare that to like a Path to Glory. Yeah. Um, I I think it's probably better than Path to Glory. Comparing it to like Combat Commander, like you said, I don't know because Combat Commander is more of a tactical. Yeah. A know, scenario based level. game. You yeah. can play any scenario. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a good comparison. But I I think it's really good, and I'm I I'm surprised that it's managed to be better than, than Twilight Struggle. I'm shocked. Well, what I'm kind of shocked by is it's not more popular right now. It feels like it's still a little bit under the radar. Yeah. It feels like it should really be out there now. And I think that where the board game industry was when Twilight Struggle first came out and when Twilight Struggle was at the top of the, board, the, the BGG rankings, I think it was a different environment. I don't think, like if Twilight Struggle had come out now, I, I don't think it would have gotten the reception that it got back then. That's like the, the, be true. the board game industry has like exploded too much, but this is definitely worth checking out. I forget what the MSRP is on this Rory, but like, I think it's on there. Is it on here? Uh, yes, it is. It's, uh, it's 60 bucks, 59 bucks, which I think is an amazing price for how much game is in that box. The amount of game, the amount of components, um, the board is re- nice and thick, really nice. Um, 
but just the amount of gameplay that you get in this box, like it's, it's pretty incredible. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our review of Imperial struggle, a five from Rory and a six from me. Well, Rory, thanks for helping us out because there's no way Alex is going to play this. No, no problem. This is a lot of fun. I'm glad uh, I was able to do this with you. You are listening to the Dukes of Dice, proud members of the Dice Tower Network. For other great shows in the network, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. Back to Alex and Sean for this week's Dukes Double Take. All right, this week on the Dukes Double Take, we're taking a look back at episode 208, I Am Not a Turk, where we were reviewing Watergate from Capstone Games. Sean, at the time, I gave this one a high five, not quite a six. I said this is a tense, exciting, quick game, my kind of game. Didn't have a ton of negative things to say about it. Thought it was an excellent tug of war. It captured the theme well. The one thing that held it back from being, say, a low six, Abby didn't enjoy it. And I don't play two-player games a ton without Abby, and uh, this was one of her least favorite games she's played. And so as a result of that, a little tough, a little tough to to call it any higher than a five. Uh, But really enjoyed the game, thought it was great. Sean, at the time, you gave this a probational four. You said you weren't sure how often you'd play. It wasn't as thematic as you'd like. You didn't find it to be an accurate simulation of Watergate, although you liked the gameplay well enough. You just weren't sure how often you would play it. Uh, you did admit that at least there was at least some lingering bitterness in all of this because you had designed a Watergate-themed game, uh, Sean Gate, that had uh, had not come to fruition. Was it, it was about Nixon's legacy after Watergate, correct? It was. <laughs> so I was in the middle of doing the research. I'd already read like three or four books, uh, different books about Watergate at the time, and I, and I had the basic outline of the game in my head. Um, and it was going to be very much a heavier game uh, a card driven game in, in the vein of, of twilight struggle where you were basically, you weren't Nixon and you weren't like Bob Woodward or Woodward and Bernstein. Uh, but you were sort of playing as the ephemeral Nixon's legacy. And you were trying to do things to preserve Nixon's legacy that, uh, while it was focused on Watergate, there were other elements like foreign, like foreign policy and, and opening or normalizing relations with China, uh, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I mean, very different games, but I'm like a Watergate designed by Matthias Cromer or a Watergate designed by Sean Ramirez. Yeah. Yeah. So it's fine. Everything's fine. I will, I will say it's a fine game. My, my, as objectively as possible, my, my critiques from a year ago still stand. It's not as thematic as I wanted it to be. Um, and it, it felt to me like an abstract, uh, like an abstract game. There, there were moments in Imperial Struggle, moments in Twilight Struggle, where you can really feel that theme come through. This is a much different game. It's a much lighter game. It just didn't feel thematic to me. Um, do you like how I pretended like I had already done the review of Imperial Struggle there? Rory and I haven't actually recorded it by this point. But um, And then the other, the other issue, too, was that it wasn't it wasn't a simulation of Watergate and not that it had to be and not that it even purports to be, but I feel like with a game that's based on, uh, on history like that, that it, there should be more of a simulation aspect. If that makes sense. So. I, uh, yeah, I get, I get it. I still felt it was a really thematic game, especially for the weight of game. It was, it, it felt like it to me. I, I get your critiques that it's not a pure simulation, but in terms of feeling like you're, you're Nixon and you feel the pressure and people are getting closer and closer, that tension existed there for me. Um, sure. So, in any case, uh, have you played it since? I have not. And in fact, I got rid of it at a gamer's garage sale. So does that make it a three? I, th- I think so. I, I think it's, like I said, I think it's a fine game. It is, I think, worthy of... I think people should check it out. I think people... W- well... Clearly, people, many more people like it than I do. Um, it, it's a very popular game. It's rated pr- pretty highly on BGG. It's a good game, and I don't want to give it any disservice. Um, I, I typically have a pretty high bar for Capstone. Capstone is one of my favorite publishers, and, and I mean, the numbers of fives and sixes that they've produced is pretty incredible. So, um, 
yeah, I'm, but I, I, it's going to be a three. It's going to be a okay. Three. Yeah, fair enough. I think if you hadn't designed a Watergate themed game at some point, or looked to design a Watergate themed game, it would be higher. I, I just, I don't think that's true. I, I think I can be pretty objective, Alex. I disagree. Anyway, I still give this one a five because it's a great game, and I would rarely turn on a play of it, even though Abby doesn't want to play it. So there you go. Uh, Gil did have some thoughts on this. Uh, Sean, you go first with this one because there was one I wanted to specifically respond to. Absolutely. So BJ says, Watergate was my number two favorite game last year, and we're still playing it on occasion, although to be fair, Unmatched has taken up most of our two-player games. It's a six for me. Love the theme, love the mechanics, love the tension. Yep, I'm right there with BJ. Tim Tix, not with thoughts on Watergate specifically, but was curious. When I listened to Abby's review of Europe Divided, I wondered if she'd like Watergate as a two-player political conflict game that isn't about war. She liked a lot in Europe Divided, but not the war aspect, and wondered how anyone would play war. She said this should be an escapist hobby, and I immediately, respectfully, disagreed. And you weren't the only one, I'm sure, Tim. Uh, so I will say this. I played Watergate with Abby before I played Europe Divided with Abby. Uh, Watergate is a game, and this can be the case with, with a lot of games, where if it's your first play and someone else has played this one before, they can smack you upside the head and smack you upside the head pretty good in Watergate. And her first and only play of this, I it was sort of a Smithison uh, uh, reference. This is a weird reference, but basically to one, uh, what is the name of that game? <laughs> Keyforge. Keyforge. To when I played Keyforge and I taught someone Keyforge and I'd play with a deck I really liked and gave them the deck that wasn't so good. Multiple people. You did this to multiple people. I did this to multiple people. Uh, I didn't, you, know, you can't really do this with Watergate. There isn't one character that's so much better than the other, but it can have that kind of feel of, cool, well, I'm not doing anything and you're going to clearly win and this is annoying and I don't like this experience. That was her m primary problem with Watergate. I don't think she loved the theme either. I don't think any of these historically based hyper-realistic themes she's going to love. I think she tends to enjoy the more escapist type themes, just as her personal preference. Uh, I think she's made some broader comments too, though, about uh, what the hobby should or shouldn't entail. and eh, That's more of her take on things she enjoys. Uh, I would say with with something like uh, with Watergate, it, it just wasn't a game that she enjoyed as much mechanically and didn't enjoy the first play experience. It's possible if we had both been learning it for the first time, she might have enjoyed it a bit more, but it's not a theme that was ever going to grab her. Uh, whether it's war or, well, it's not war, it's a political conflict. It's the same. She hasn't tended to like games that are this direct conflict type of a theme. I can't think of a one. War Chest, she really didn't, she really didn't like. Uh, Onitama, she really didn't like. I, it, it would be hard to think of one. I mean, Europe Divided, she liked in spite of that theme, not because of that theme. So, yeah, just just wasn't one for her, which is unfortunate because I like the game a lot, but uh, but I get it. I You know, you got to be careful with your first play experiences. Sometimes you can just ruin it. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, Sean. I know. Sean's laughing because this was absolutely me early in my gaming experience, where if the first play was off... Uh, we had problems, and I was I was a spoiled little kid on some of that what, stuff. What's, so. What was your nickname? Uh, you called me a princess in the P. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So everything has to be just right. No, I get it. Otherwise, anyway. the princess in the P doesn't want to lay on her board games. Yeah, I get it. Anyway, that's our double take of Watergate. Uh, stays at a five for me. Goes from a four to a three for a very biased Sean Ramirez. Finally, before we wrap things up, the best of the rest. The names we didn't use for this episode, but could have used... Let's start things off with Joshian Gurr with Unleash the Two, which was a very clever name, uh, similar to the one we ended up going with. The only thing I'd say is two tends to have a negative connotation, and my hope is, uh, because we write things on a you know six-point scale here at the Dukes of Dice, uh, I, I don't want my marriage to have a negative connotation. Uh, so Unleashing the Two, while accurate, not the association I wanted. So that's probably why I leaned away from that name. Yeah. Good, good try anyway, Joshian. And then BJ suggested... All is fair in love, war, and politics. And I think that encapsulates both games, and there's the love for uh, the wedding. That's right. Don Gilstrap with Two's Company, referencing all the two-player games and, you know, company that, that Abby and I now share. And then Philip Millman suggested marriage, 
of imperial convenience, which is totally all about uh, the marriages in, uh, <laughs> in imperial struggle. I, I don't think that implies to yours and Abby's nuptials. No, I don't think so. You're not uniting two warring empires? No, no. That would have been a very awkward long weekend if, if so. So, nope, okay. didn't happen. Uh, and then finally, Francois Miley with A World for Two. So, very nice names this week, Guild. Good job. If you want to name episodes, you should hop on our Guild. It's super fun. Guild number 2008. Go do it. Because I said so. Before we go, Alex, and I'll make this quick. Mm. Um, with all of the high points you've had this week, hopefully an additional high point was you having watched the Dune trailer. Did you watch the Dune trailer? I did trailer? watch the Dune trailer. Okay. Are, well, are you excited about this movie? I'm I'm super excited. It looks fantastic. Uh, I wow, Jason Momoa is Duncan Idaho. I'm so on board. I'm so so on board. I feel like I need to reread the book before going and seeing the movie. I am listening to it currently. I've read it ten to fifteen times, and I figured that it's, it's got a, it's supposed to have a really good audiobook. It is a really good audiobook. I'm about uh, about a fifth of the way through, uh, and it's got a really good. Um, it's got multiple. Uh, readers, multiple actors, voice actors that play the different parts. So um, I'm super excited. I'm, I'm just, it's yeah, super exciting. I hope you're not afraid of missing it because fear is the mind killer. Uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. All right. Good. good. Don't be afraid. No, no, just saying. no, no. All right. Well, that's going to do it for episode 233 <laughs> named by D Shannon best at two. Sean, another weird one this next episode with uh, with Mariah joining the show. That'll be super cool, actually. I got to tell you, we can't be slaves to the format, Alex, even when it when it means Duke's not reviewing games or yeah. or some Duke's not reviewing games. So. No, I've got I've got a trick up my sleeve. I'll, I, I think I've got a way of giving you some relief on the following episode. So. OK. All right. Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, that's going to do it until next time. This is Sean and Alex. And duke you later, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the Dukes of Dice. Today's episode was recorded in the Duchy on September 10th, 2020. Our theme music provided by Carbo Hydro M from his Prime Legacy album. The Dukes of Dice are a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. For other great board gaming podcasts, check out DiceTowerNetwork.com. And for all the latest in the Duchy, go to DukesOfDice.com. Find us on Twitter at Dukes of Dice. Join in conversations on our Board Game Geek Guild. Find us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks to our sponsors, Arcane Wonders and Game Toppers, LLC. You can learn more about Arcane Wonders fine titles at arcanewonders.com and find out all you need to know about Game Toppers at gametoppersllc.com. We'll see you back here in two weeks. Until then, game on.